Good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending where, where you are on this fast forward planet, uh, still sadly wrapped in a pandemic, despite the great progress that's been made in the last few months in the United States and a number of other countries on vaccine distribution. And there's still about, I think the last count I saw about 6 billion people on the planet who have not yet been vaccinated. There are entire countries that have seen maybe one or two doses of vaccine administered. And that, that means it's a lot of work to be done. In the meantime, it's a, a, a heating a heating planet, a human heated planet, as I've been writing for decades, as scientists have been studying for decades, and as policymakers have been fig trying to figure out for decades. There's a lot of work to be done on both fronts to build a sustainable, sustainable uh, pathway forward. Uh, this is the Earth Institute uh, Sustain What broadcast. Uh, today, it's uh, what I call a friendly takeover. Uh, my friends uh, in the education session here, section of Columbia University, the Earth Institute, and the, uh, the Evolving Climate School, which is a new initiative here. And uh, we have special guests from both the sciences and education and uh, governance, uh, in the case of uh, former Governor Pete Chunlin from Vermont, who's here today. You'll learn more about each person's role in helping youth uh, lead on climate action. Uh, there are plenty of youth around us right now who are doing a really good job of this already. They don't need much help. But um, when I think of this arena, I think mostly about um, what can we do to facilitate better conversations between those with expertise and experience and those who are emerging leaders. Um, and it's great to have this panel here today. today. And he here's uh, who we have on, on tap at the moment. Uh, more coming on. Again, I'm Andy Revkin. Mainly a journalist. I've been at Columbia for a year and a half, running a new initiative on communication and sustainability. Uh, next to me is uh, former Governor Pete Chumlin of, of Vermont. Great to be with you uh, virtually. It would be better <laughs> to be there in person, as uh, some of these folks will be this summer. And how are you doing? Thanks for having me. And I'm excited to be on the show and with all these esteemed colleagues at Columbia. It's going to be great. Great. Well, we'll learn more from you in a few minutes. So we were just talking about uh, uh, the Irene impact on Vermont years ago, which I reported on when I was still at the New York Times. And uh, there was a great flood, of another great storm, uh, 1922 was this one uh, that was devastating. These Figuring out how to build resilient landscapes in the face of natural hazards is a big part of what happens going forward. Vermont is no stranger to that challenge. Tom That's Chandler, right. Tom Chandler is no stranger to that challenge either. Right next to you, he's a research scientist at the National Center for Disaster Preparedness at the Earth Institute of Columbia University. And I'm just planning two sessions later this week with your colleagues on uh, resilience and ch children in Puerto Rico on Wednesday and in North Carolina on Friday. Great to have you here too. Uh, you're in this arena that I basically I thought my beat is the environment when I started. And it's really my beat has been disaster risk for decades. Um, and this phrase keeps coming to mind. It's um, on my blog at the New York Times in 2008, a reader posted this comment. He said, are we stuck with blah, 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 bang? And I keep asking that same question. So Tom Chandler, it's great to have you here. Thank you very much. Looking forward to it. And Lisa Goddard, a fantastic scientist at the intersection of climate and food and society, uh, running, a, among other things, an extremely important project at Columbia University, the ACT Today project in six, at least six countries, mostly sort of around the equator, on how to, how to uh, foster sufficient nutri nutrition, new food for people in the world heading toward 9 billion of us in a changing climate. Uh, great work that you do. And it's great to see you uh, as part of this, uh, this initiative that will be in Vermont this summer. Thanks, Andy. Looking forward to it. Uh, Cassie Shu, who's the uh, Education and Outreach Director for Lamont and for Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory and for uh, the Earth Institute, who have been super impressed with your energy and, and how you adapted to the online environment uh, running Earth Institute um, live initiatives like this one for teachers and students. It's great to, that you've, uh, you're helping to pull this together. Excited to be here. Thanks, Andy. And Laurel Zama, also an education and outreach coordinator at Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory, who I first uh, intersected with uh, from the field station down uh, on the Hudson River in Piermont, uh, where there are fish tanks and the like. And we were all scrambling uh, many months ago to figure out how to do an open house for a huge, wonderful lab full of 
active stuff that you want to see and touch, uh, but to do that virtually. So it's great to see you again, too. Thank you. Great to be here and great to see everyone. And I see here Art Learner Lamb, who, <laughs> speaking of disasters, <laughs> I got to know Art when, no, not you're not a disaster, <laughs> but <laughs> I, I first intersected with Art Learner Lamb again when I was a reporter for New York Times, and you had done this incredibly valuable global survey of dis natural disaster hotspots. And I learned things, I think it was Costa Rica, it's one of the countries, at least at that time, that had pretty much everything, volcanoes, earthquakes, floods, you name it. And so having that map of risk, uh, of hazard is really important. And you're also um, a leader in the education side of Columbia, the climate school that's coming and um, your deputy director of Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory uh, and, and much more. So it's great to have you in this conversation too. Uh, thank you, Andy. Uh, that study was actually done with uh, Lisa's group as well. There were a lot oh. of contributors, and even uh, Tom uh, Irwin contributed a bit to that as well when we were doing it at the National Center for Disaster Preparedness. But thank you for this. I'm looking yeah. forward to the discussion. Well, I'm happy to be uh, helping to just sort of manage it. I'm going to make sure uh, Cassie and everybody kind of gets into the flow of things going forward. I do think it would be great to think, like, imagine if Google Maps, which we all poke at every day almost, if you had a way to like click a layer and it would just be the disaster risk map. So wherever you are in the world, you can see, okay, oh, here's the wildfire map. Oh, here's the, uh, the flood zone map. It just feels like we're surrounded by possibilities like that going forward. And I'm hoping that young people and, and educators uh, are thinking creatively about the task ahead. It's not just, you know, getting in the streets. It's not just getting people to vote. That's a big part of the climate problem. It's not just the tech technology, the engineering, the basic science, but it's also how do we visualize, how do we communicate? Uh, so I'm going to switch on back to the slides a bit so we can kind of move forward into this discussion. Um, and the key here is, again, youth and, and empowering. And um, often it means getting out of the way, but often it means how do we build better relationships with people of the across generations. And um, I do like to start these shows with a bit of an acknowledgement of where we are and what was here before. This is essentially Colombia's landscape, at least outside of the global, the global centers, which are all around the world. You're looking at the Hudson River cut through the Palisades, billion year old rock up here where I live in the Hudson Valley. And here are the two campuses, uh, the two main parts of Colombia, uh, uh, down in the city, uh, including in Manhattanville, where the climate school will be, and Lamont Doherty. But this is the landscape underneath that landscape. And this is the website, uh, native land, native-land.ca. It's Canadian. But it's kind of a Google Maps for indigenous history. And I, again, I see so much potential in uh, sharing, uh, acknowledge, not just acknowledging where we are, but really understanding uh, it with some depth um, what was there before. And you take away the modern labels and you have the Lenape, various parts of Lenape peoples who were um, the substrate who, who tended these lands uh, long, long before um, colonization and before the house that I live in was built in the Hudson Valley and before the campus of Columbia was built. So the climate school is the key element here. And the question here is uh, how do we create opportunity for people who are not yet in college? But it'd be great if we could hear briefly from Maybe uh, Art and from Lisa, you know, when you think of a climate school, and, and as Alex Halliday has said, like no other, what comes to mind? You, you know, and how does that relate to what's going to be offered for young people who are not yet in college? But maybe, maybe Art and then Lisa, just a quick vision of this. I think a very quick vision would simply be that if we're dealing with these global crises like climate that have local impact, uh, that all facets of knowledge need to be brought to bear. Disciplinary strength alone is not enough. Uh, being able to have an open mind with respect to the contributions that other fields can make to a solution. For a youngster getting engaged, not just in STEM, but in any other field of endeavor, I think understanding how to knit together an interdisciplinary fabric uh, is going to be really important, no matter when you start thinking about your own education or your own motivations for doing things. So crossing borders, crossing uh, disciplines is a key part of this. Uh, least... Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I want to underscore that multidisciplinary aspect of the school because I think it's 
it's really unique and something that a lot of students have been looking for for a really long time. Like how to master a subject and still make it relevant to all of this, the areas that it touches. So typically things have been very disciplinary as Art was saying, or they're just sort of broad kind of survey sort of information. And so this is really an opportunity for somebody to, to focus on, on an area of, of academia that they love, but also within the context of how the earth needs to use that, the world needs to use that information these days. Lisa, could you just describe the work you do? I think it perfectly illustrates this concept of a climate school being more than a, like a climate change school, right? It's much more than that, right? Yeah, I think so. Um, I mean, certainly climate variability is, a, is an important part of it uh, as well. Um, <clears throat> because the, the sort, I mean, climate change is happening right now. And the sorts of things that we see as sort of poster effects of climate change all the time are already happening, droughts and floods and strong t hurricanes and things like that. So um, that is an important element of it. Um, and my center has that multidisciplinary aspect, but, but we're just a research center. So actually getting that into the education is, is tremendous. And, and Cassie, maybe you could speak to that part of it just briefly, the, the interlacing and the work that you do and how to, to build this, this out from just the research and not even just the students on our campuses, but beyond that. Yeah, thanks. Um, and as as Art and Lisa said, I think it's it's you know we are we're at Columbia University. We have all this wonderful research going on, and f trying to figure out how to get it to different audiences at different stages in their lives, different stages in their careers, um, whether it's before they get to college, whether it's first day of elementary school, whether it's a lifelong learner who's come back to. Um, kind of who maybe wants to make a pivot in his or her career. Um, these are all different educational opportunities and touch points um, and everyone can can take different pathways to be involved in in this research, to be engaged with this content. Um, so what we're really hoping to do with the Columbia Climate School from an education point of view is really to provide those opportunities, uh, to not only provide the content uh, learning, but to also provide the spaces uh, and the different content texts uh, that we need for, for that important education to happen. And let's now we'll take this to Vermont. Um, so Governor Pete Shumlin, how did how did this relationship start? In other words, why are why is this happening in Vermont? Uh, tell me about the Putney travel work that you do and uh, yeah, we'll so get into that summer program a little bit. Sure. I mean, I'm super excited to be working with the group of people that you're hearing from right now. Uh, so I kind of have two roles. One, Putney was actually founded by my parents 70 years ago. So this is what I did uh, pre my, my community service of serving as governor for three terms. Uh, but it interrelates because when I ran for governor, you know, it was the bottom of the recession. It didn't matter what party you were, everyone was running on a simple jobs, how are we gonna create jobs, how are we gonna make it happen? And I'm a Democrat. I was listening to the Democratic candidates in the primaries who were all talking about their economic plans. And I just thought, God, none of these are bold enough. Uh, I'm going to run for governor. I won't win because I'm from the wrong end of the state. We don't have any people in Southern Vermont. They're all up around Burlington, up on the lake in the north. Anyway, but I'll raise some issues. And one thing I said is, you elect me, we're going to shut down the leaking, aging nuclear power plant that provides most of our power. And we're going to build out wind like you've never seen before, solar like you've never seen before. We're going to do energy efficiency like you've never seen before. And we're going to create jobs and at the same time help reduce our carbon footprint, show how little state can do it. Anyway, long and short of it is, I ended up winning. And the first thing that I did was pass a comprehensive energy plan and go to work doing this. And to give you the short version, in three terms as governor, uh, we ended up becoming the number one solar state in America. We created thousands of jobs. Today in Vermont, if you have 17 people in a room, one of them works in a renewable energy business. Uh, we reduced power rates. So as we moved to renewables and shut down the old nuclear, uh, people's rates went down, not up, for three of the four years that I was uh, serving. I served for six. But, and, uh, you know, a lot of great things happened. So my point is, how does it intersect with Columbia and what we're talking about here? Vermont is a great model 
when young people want to get involved and make a difference, what I find in speaking to them a lot is, yeah, they can walk out on sc of school on Fridays. Great, it gets attention, it gets headlines, it helps, it definitely helps to drive the issue. But what they often say to you is, but give me the resources to do more. I know that walking out of school on Friday is not going to save the planet that my kids and grandkids have to grow up on. So what's so exciting about my involvement in this and why I'm so excited about it is Columbia is making the biggest commitment to climate of any higher education university right now with this entire team that you're seeing and so many others. What we have in the Green Mountains is a great example of how public policy can actually turn dreams into action. And I think what young people want to know is, how do I get the resources to right. help save ourselves from ourselves before it's too late? And I really think that's what this effort's all about. So I'm a director of Putney. I'm a former politician. What my passion is, is giving students the tools they need to solve the only problem that matters right now if we want to live on the planet. So super excited to be here and to be part of Columbia's Climate School in the Green Mountains. That's great. I, I'm going to get to, to um, Laurel in a minute, but I wanted to hear from Tom Chandler on the resilient side of the climate problem. I think one of the things I've learned in my journalism on this issue over decades is um, it's it's sort of easy to write about global warming, meaning as this thing, this big unitary thing, my 1988 cover story of global warming is no different than the stories I've written in the 33 years since then. Uh, but it's only when you split it into its component parts that you find action points. You know, you can shout, you can shout, fight the climate crisis for the rest of your life, but that doesn't really do much unless you identify, well, what is the crisis? And then you get to the energy question and the vulnerability question. And vulnerability differences lead to justice questions. And, and the National Center for Disaster Preparedness you know, climate change is really just a super slow-mo form, form of uh, the same kind of phenomenon we've, we've dealt with on, for a long time, other disasters. So how does that relate? You know, when you think of the what a student or young person would need to learn, uh, what, what's that side of it feel like uh, going yeah. through? Yeah, well, I think when we when we think about climate change, really the, the main lens that um, this intergenerational catastrophe is going to be experienced is through disasters. Uh, disasters are increasing. Um, the amount of money, funds to uh, support the rising disasters has gone way up. The uh, 2017 hurricane season was over $300 billion in uh, disaster costs, which was really unprecedented. And um, this relates to disaster preparedness, response, recovery, and resiliency. And a number of different ways, mitigation efforts, new government programs under the, the Biden administration, such as the FEMA BRIC program, disaster response. There's a number of new ways to look at this in terms of long-term uh, power outages, such as Puerto Rico experienced more than a year of rolling blackouts and how that impacts uh, medical equipment that is electricity dependent. And then when you get into recovery and long-term resiliency, the psychological aspects, the um, uh, dealing with the rebuilding of the, the built environment and mass migration issues in, in right. the United States as well as internationally. Uh, there's a, a multitude of, of problems that are not really addressed in K-12 curricula in schools at the current time. Oftentimes when this is discussed in schools, it's, it's geared for a science-oriented curriculum. But what about all of these policy issues and uh, current events and uh, decision-making uh, that needs to be undertaken and discussed right now by uh, America's youth and internationally is, I think, really a, a critically important missing link. And, and the other thing that's exciting to me about that side of this question is it's something that every, that has local elements. You know, the federal policy questions are really important. You know, where, where do you set the price of carbon? Um, what do we do about energy innovation? Should there be regulations of CO2? But the disaster risk part, the uh, flood risk, fire risk, that's something that a young person or an older person can do something about in your own time on the land that you inhabit. You know, And I think that's what gets missed sometimes. Uh, there, we'll talk about this. What are the action points? But that feels like one. And then we get to oh. the world. Oh, yeah, I, I think um, the, uh, the geospatial element and looking at it within a local context and your uh, place-based learning in terms of how you can relate the uh, disaster situation such as the flood um, 
in relation to the actual classroom environment around it is, is so important. I'm just showing very briefly, uh, I wrote a lot about wildfire questions. And just uh, for those who haven't tuned in to the local opportunities around the climate challenge, one is so manifestly illustrated in these satellite images from that terribly disastrous, disaster struck community, Paradise, California. This was one, one neighborhood there. And you can see right away so, so many things here, just briefly, that um, tell you there's um, something so there's work to be done. One is that as um, the fire historian Stephen Pine told me, this was an urban fire within a forest. The trees are not burned. If you look carefully, you see that the trees around this neighborhood are not burned. And also not all the houses burned. Some of that could have been luck. Some of that could have been uh, building differentials. And so there, there too, always there's something to examine going forward that it feels really important. So thank you for that. And Laurel, you know, so back to the education sphere, you're already working with community outreach and education down at the waterfront. Uh, and uh, uh, when you're when you're not, you know, off campus, um, doing great work uh, there. So what excites you about this kind of initiative and what Columbia can do for young people? I think youth are hungry for this information. There are so many. So right now, youth are already so tapped into um, so many different information sources through social media. So they are much more aware than other generations, especially about climate. And they want, as the governor said, the resources, the tools to learn how they can empower themselves, their family, their friends, and what they can do to make change. So I am so excited for this summit. I think we're gonna do just that. Um, the students that are already interested have already have that background understanding, um, but maybe they don't understand all of the risks. Maybe they don't understand all the drivers. So um, I think we're gonna be able to provide that information for them to build a community and to empower them, which is the goal, the ultimate goal. I just have to share um, from Twitter. This was you. <laughs> this was you. Let's see, when was that? It was actually October. Was it October? Yeah. It feels way longer, longer <laughs> ago than that. So, uh, uh, the, just uh, you could explain the the field station. The fact that this this connectivity with the communities is really important. Yes, absolutely. So the field station is um, just a little bit north of our Lamont campus at the end of Piermont Pier. Uh, it is a hub for scientific research and education and outreach. So we have an opportunity to engage um, students, teachers, and just the, the local public um, about uh, scientific uh, research that we do at Lamont, but also everything about the Hudson. So we want people to get involved, to do these field explorations, to get in the Hudson. They're gonna be sampling their own fish, the water quality, so they can then better learn about their own um, natural environment around them. So this is a good time to focus a little bit on the on what's what would happen in, in Vermont this and the dates and stuff. So hold on, I'm gonna just uh, get back to the slides. And maybe Cassie, can you just describe and, and uh, Governor Shumlin, maybe just describe a little bit about the this project on the ground as it's planned. Sure thing. I'll I'll kick that off. And Andy, I think it was actually in conversation with you maybe a couple of months ago, um, or could have been years, um, where you said uh, climate change is this process that's happening sort of globally, where we hear about it happening globally, but the impacts are all going to be local. And I think this. Uh, Columbia Climate School and the Green Mountains program is going to address both of those those pieces and those very important pieces of, of climate change. So we're going to create the opportunity um, and the space for students to come and engage um, with each other, with experts from Columbia's Earth Institute and the Future Climate School. Um, and we're going to excite them uh, about um, about all the things that they can do locally, things that they can take action on, um, but also to really understand the science behind climate change and what's really happening um, and how do we know scientifically this is for sure, this is definitely happening. Um, how do we use information that we have to make predictions about the future? How do we address risk? Um, but also on the flip side, it's also about 
uh, impacts in environmental justice and communication. And so these are just some of the big themes that we'll address um, this summer. Um, it's going to be a 13 day program that will take place in person in Castleton, Vermont um, on Castleton University's beautiful campus. Um, and we are partnering partnering with Putney Student Travel uh, to run this. And I'll let uh, Governor Shumlin talk a little bit more about their summer programs. Um, but we really are, our faculty, our staff are very excited about this particular opportunity. Um, it's not only an opportunity for the youth to engage, like I said, with, with our faculty and our staff, but also to engage in meaningful conversations with each other. And they're going to network and meet like-minded individuals um, and be able to work with each other and hopefully continue um, those important partnerships and conversations uh, going forward beyond, beyond the summer. Yeah, I mean, Cassie just did a great job of describing the program. Really, this is not a program for students who want to debate weather. This is a pro uh, program for students who understand that this is the biggest challenge that we're facing and want the resources to make it happen and be with a community of people who share the conviction that we've got to move now. And there's going to be all kinds of different students involved. There will be students who want to, are, in, 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 you know, really excited about the entrepreneurial opportunities in climate change. I keep saying, listen, you know, if you want to uh, make a lot of money, uh, there's a lot of people right here in Vermont that we will connect you with who have done great things for the environment, figured out how to monitor wind for the wind systems all over the world, that made millions of dollars doing it. A friend who has developed the, who developed the first solar tracker that followed the sun included the increased the efficiencies of solar panels dramatically. We'll connect you with utility executives in the state who said, we can do better and still make money by getting rid of this notion that power companies, utilities are places where you generate as much power as you can, shoot it through wires to as much, have customers buy as much as you can and bill them as much as you can to let's become an energy efficiency company. You know, a company that literally takes an old building. Uh, and we have a lot of old houses in Vermont. Uh, goes in and with one-stop shopping, with on-bill financed through cooperation with government. So government, utilities, and private enterprise working together will come in and, you know, tear out your old windows, blow cellulose into your house, take out the oil burner in the basement, replace it with solar panels, put in a hot, a cold air heat pump in the basement so you're fossil fuel free, you're cooled in the summertime, you're hot in the wintertime, and you know, you burn, you're totally green, and you're saving money as you do it. Utility exec who helped do that. Uh, so, you know, all kinds of real connections with people in entrepreneurial opportunities. Or you might be interested, as Cassie mentioned, in social justice, working with people who are actively out there, ensuring that we connect the dots between the planet that's crumbling right before us and how we ensure that the most vulnerable populations, we know who they are, uh, who are currently getting kicked in the teeth by this, have ways to move forward and organized ways with government, with everybody involved, to make sure that we do this in a thoughtful way. So really, what's the program look like? You come to Vermont, a two-week program. Uh, it's going to be incredibly intense. It's going to be a lot of fun, but we're going to be really engaging and connecting you with people that we hope will inspire you to go back home with a plan that you can carry forward with your own lifetime that will help us to get there faster than we would have without you. I think that's really what it's all about. You know, and I, I think uh, uh, Governor Shumley is really on to something here. Yeah, yeah. There's a, a there's lot a of uh, feedback and yeah. data on your yeah. line. I'm not sure what's going on. Could you try to maybe reconnect? before uh, just test your um audio that, that's great i'm just be before we get back to art um i was looking online and i saw here that you know the, the history of wind power in the united states as as uh, governor shumlin was saying there's the history of vermont is is essentially the history of these efforts to foster renewable uh, technology and energy and the like you also have this guy named bill mckibben my old friend uh, over uh, not too far away, and and so much is going on there that relates to these big questions about trade-offs and other. You know, wind is expanding these things to the capacity we would need them in a um, 
in a post-carbon grid comes up with its own set of questions as well. So that's, I assume that's part of the learning too, is uh, the, the policy. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the political pushback. I mean, like you've got to really look at it. You know, uh, we all resist change. We're all frightened of change. And when there's a lot of change, folks freak out. And, you know, by the time we were done, yeah, we were the number one solar state in America. We've increased wind 22 times in my three terms of what we had. So if there was one windmill when I went in, it was 22 when we left. You know, we had solar panels, panels everywhere. Uh, but, you know, the people of Vermont got really, many of them got very upset about that. You know, they, they thought it didn't look good in the fields, that the wind, you know, kills bats and bees or whatever the arguments are. So the point is you have to look at both how you move forward and also how you do it in a way that actually allows you to make the change that we can make in a very short period of time. So it's really, I mean, there's so many facets of this that this program is going to dig into and give students the tools they need to move forward. That's what it's all about. Well, and I think that's where the access to folks like Tom and, and Lisa and uh, Professor Lerner Lamb too, all of you professors, uh, uh, comes in because you, you're you working at the end, much of the work you do is the basic science, but also integrating it with the societal decisions and existing norms. As I said earlier, blah, 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 bang is is a real phenomenon that we always underinvest in disasters, unfortunately. Art, Before can we that. hear you now? Yeah, let's see. Well, is this any better? I'm not sure. Ah, yes. That's You're beautiful. Fine. That's beautiful. All right. Well, Art, what was on your mind? <laughs> <laughs> Quite a bit, but I was wanted to respond to Governor Shumlin's statement uh, about there being opportunities as well. I, you know, there's a paradigm in the cl whole climate change discussion uh, where we've been talking about risk, uh, in some cases, gloom and doom. That's important. People have to be aware. People have to understand. People have to be able to know what the impacts are so that there can be a response that shouldn't be diminished at all. But if you, you know, get into the mind of a 16 year old who wants to get into college and wants to choose a major and wants to think about what their future is going to be, it's all going to be about opportunity. What can they do? How can they grow? What impact will they have uh, on the future in some way? I've seen some of the comments here as well. And we're seeing that, by the way, in our relationships with uh, our partners outside the university, not just me, but in the private sector as well. This notion that the whole conversation around climate is acknowledging risk, but shifting to the opportunities to deal with it. Not just profit making opportunities, but uh, changing the way in which society deals with the home planet in a very general way. And I think that sort of paradigm shift in education is what we're trying to accomplish, at least in the climate school. And we hope we can do that with the example that we're setting with Putney. That sounds like a promising approach. Um, and Lisa, too, just again, quickly, um, all these different contexts, whether the various countries, Guatemala through parts of Africa, uh, what I assume kids coming in the summer can also have an opportunity to learn about the work they can do worldwide, not just at the local level. Absolutely. I mean, there's a tremendous amount um, that needs doing. Uh, my institute, which I mentioned before, is, is multidisciplinary. So about half of our researchers are climate scientists and the other half work in areas that are impacted by climate, so that could be agriculture, health, water, disasters, um, and the financial instruments as well that kind of helps um, support policies to, to deal with something. We primarily work in developing countries, so that's the nature of these uh, countries in our big project that are, are largely kind of organized in the tropics. Um, I mean, there's a lot of vulnerable people in the United States as well, but there is so much need around the world um, to understand the information that's relevant to the people you're talking to, um, to put that into terms that they can actually use and make decisions about, and and build those solutions. How are you going to use this? What sort of uh, technology or decisions or policies um, can be developed that help people use the climate information so that they make better decisions so that they become more resilient? Um, yeah, the, the field is wide open for, uh, for more people to be involved and make a difference. That's great. Um, let me just throw that slide on here again. Just, here we go. Uh, so as you see here too, there's environmental justice and 
you know, anyone who thinks of Vermont, some sometimes folks think of Vermont, uh, they think of the privileged parts of Vermont, but they don't think of the full landscape of Vermont. And as governor, clearly Governor Shumlin, you dealt with the you dealt with the full Vermont, just as President Biden says he's governing for all Americans. Um, and could you give a snapshot of, of this? You know, there's injustice, there's poverty, there's rural uh, issues yeah, I mean, and, and urban issues. Absolutely. And, you know, Vermont is much like the rest of the country where our cities uh, are prosperous, good jobs. Burlington is the main city in Vermont. But Rutland, which is very close to where this uh, pro program will be run, uh, and, and Rutland County, there's a tremendous amount of poverty. Uh, there is real challenges, you know, for folks making a living, getting roof over their heads and, and putting food on a table for families. But I think the, and, and frankly, we struggle with many of the same struggles that everybody else is struggling with from uh, the challenges of uh, affordable health care to issues like opiate uh, disorder and the rest. So really, I think, you know, the beauty of this program is that you get the resources of Columbia but you're in a state where people are really accessible. Remember, we're a teeny state. It is not unusual to be able to call up the governor and talk to the governor in this state. Certainly able to talk to the lieutenant governor anytime you want. You know, to be able to real access to policymakers, to entrepreneurs. We're kind of like a big family up here. And we have our the same struggles that every other state does. So, you know, really what we want to do in this program is ensure that you know, we sometimes, I, I sometimes, one of the challenges of dealing with climate is that it can sometimes be seen as an elitist issue. And I can tell you in Vermont, as governor, and certainly this program, this is an issue that's bread and butter. When you can get solar panels on someone's roof and they can actually have the power company paying them instead of them paying the power company, they're not necessarily climate change zealots. They're just making a financial decision. And to be able to go in and talk to those folks, see how it's changed their lives, talk to the utility folks, see how that's structured and how it works for a utility, you can start to see the ways that we could make tremendous progress quickly in this country, moving off of fossil fuels in transportation, in heat and electricity, and moving to other ways of powering our future, and make money, bring prosperity, improve quality of life while we do it. Not just for people who have resources, but for people who don't. So. That's really the opportunity of this program is to get much closer to the decision makers, to the policy makers, the folks on the ground, people who are hurting as well as doing well, and take that information back with you with a plan for action for the future. That's what we've got to do. That's a good formula and a good plan. Um, the issue of uh, equity and is such an important one. And also the issue of listening, what you just said about folks who are happy to tie into the get to to generate solar power and put it back in the grid that transcends views about global warming that was something i wrote about in 2015 another journalist went to oklahoma to a county that was the the most skeptical county in america on climate change ground zero for what some call climate denial and he interviews this guy who's a, you know he's sort of a thin tie blue shirt oil executive from woodward county oklahoma and the first part of the interview, the guy said, well, you know, God controls the environment. And if your brain stopped there, you would go, oh my God, how can I talk to this guy? Uh, another minute later in the interview, he says, uh, half of our roof is covered with solar panels and we want to get off the grid entirely. <laughs> and, it, and the value of listening and the value of engagement across communities and not staying in a bubble is so, it's so important and it's often hard for us, especially the more concerned you get about an issue. I think the more you kind of, you're so dug in in your position, you're, you're almost like forgetting to listen. And I think Cassie uh, and, and everyone here, uh, Laurel too, as educators, you know, uh, listening is an important part of what you do. And I think that that'll be hopefully, from knowing what I know about all of you, that's a component what students will be learning too, is social dynamics, the skills that it takes to, um, cross boundaries to, to, to listen uh, actively in pursuit of uh, understanding and, and uh, collaboration. And so, uh, sorry. Oh, I just wanted to add um, from in, in terms of listening from a pedagogical approach, I, I'm thinking that this program could add a great deal of collaborative learning 
activities such as polling of students in, in terms of their, their beliefs about uh, mitigation and adaptation, case studies about uh, localized uh, issues and disasters such as Hurricane Irene and um, using geospatial tools and even incorporating like a tabletop exercise to go through with disaster response and recovery. So a lot of opportunities that could be envisioned for uh, collaborative activities that go beyond just a, a lecture and uh, going home for the day. Yeah, that, that sounds great. So I think you'll be building community. I do see the community building is a big part of what happens with students across Columbia too. Uh, even tonight, I'm gonna to be in a session with the editors of Consilience, the student-driven mag magazine. It's student kind of collaboration and is built into the fabric of how Columbia teaches. Actually, Art, I know you, you're involved very much with uh, early, early, early um, undergrad and grad school communication. Is that component sort of the team building as critical as it seems? Uh, communication is absolutely. Okay. Yeah, that's where you're headed with this. Hey, now, the importance of listening, uh, being able to take uh, uh, points of view or perspectives that are different from your own, uh, to be able to uh, talk in a language that's common uh, among the different perspectives and the different disciplines is important. We can barely do that now. Um, as we learn and build the climate schools, we begin to have these sorts of interactions. We begin to talk in, in the ways that matter to people, uh, not just our, you know, our peers reading scientific journals. So that's a, absolutely critical, and it's a learned uh, aspect of uh, somebody's personality, frankly. And it's something we really have to get into. It takes practice. <laughs> uh, you know, yeah, we... Art hit it over the head there in terms of communication, and that's one of the things we're, you know, one of the things that we focus on in this program is communication and advocacy. Super important. Uh, I'll, I'll never forget having the privilege of sitting next to President Obama right after he gave his second inaugural. And you may recall he mentioned climate change in that speech. First President of the United States to mention climate change in an inaugural address. So I turned to him and I said. Mr. President, I just can't tell you how much I appreciate that, you know? And he goes, Peter, let me say, tell you something, you know? As you know, they pull every word that I say in those speeches. And as you can imagine, that one's a flat line. We gotta find other ways to talk about it. And I came back and I vowed to myself, I wasn't gonna talk about climate change as a governor anymore. And I very rarely did. I talked about economic opportunity, I talked about jobs, I talked about ways that Vermonters would put money in their pockets, by moving from their current systems to other ways of powering their homes through our, our power grid. And you know, all that, but suddenly, you know, it started, it started moving people. They were like, hey, this guy's talking about how I can put more money in my pocket or how we can create jobs. And it, so it's really, you know, the, the question is, as Art just said is like, how do we take the passion and the lack of time and find ways not only to build big solutions that matter, but communicate in a way where we're not the lone voice, but people are responding when they don't have the time to focus on the science of climate change. They're worried about feeding their kids, putting their kids through college maybe, or community college, paying their mortgage, working three or four jobs. They're not gonna to talk to you about climate change. They will talk to you about how their economic future can look better. And that's the kind of focus that we include in this program is how do you communicate the passion in a way that most people will get excited with you instead of walking the other way? That's great. Um, so I'm just going to show uh, the last slide here too, which has some logistical information. Uh, there is an upcoming uh, informational session on this, April 8th. Thursday, yes, and is... I can speak to this a little bit. Yeah, so yeah. this Thursday, uh, we're going to be doing an info session more specifically about the Vermont program. You'll hear about um, 
admissions and the application, um, all the all the fun stuff that comes with a, a summer program. Um, this is an in-person opportunity this summer, which we think is really exciting. We know that it's been a really tough year for students, um, Zoom, and everyone is Zoomed out. And so this is why we've made a very um, conscious decision here to do this in person. And we believe that there's a lot of great value for students who, who want this type of opportunity. Uh, so we're gonna do a separate info session specifically about the Vermont program Thursday. Um, and that's the RSVP link there. And if you do have any more questions about the program, you can email that email address that's on there. We'll be uh, going over more specifically what that 13 day program looks like. Um, and I'll just add here that in both with respect to the Vermont program in the summer, but also with respect to sort of climate change education in general. I think a lot of our speakers have alluded to this, but I think it's really important that we have a little bit of something for everyone. So it is, um, you know, we might start out with a couple of foundational um, items that we believe are important. So the science behind climate change, um, what's really happening but then students also get to choose and i think this this is also where um, we kind of start to change the conversations a little bit too. Um, students can follow their own pathways and, and follow what they're interested in. Not everybody needs to be a climate scientist in the future. I do not believe that even though I work in science education. Um, I think that there's so many opportunities for students to contribute to. So both within the context of the program this summer and also for um, climate change in the classroom and what that looks like, I think students have to be able to choose their own pathways and utilize their strengths um, and to do something about and to take action about climate change. It could be through art, it could be through storytelling, it could be through community organizing, it could be through uh, actual be becoming a climate scientist. I'm, I'm realizing now there's many climate scientists within the Earth Institute who probably would disagree, who might disagree with, you know, me saying that I don't want everyone to become a climate scientist. But I think that that opportunity and that accessibility is really important. And I think Laurel has, has probably seen this as well um, in her interactions with students. If we can tap into students' energy and passion, um, and, and, and that's what we're really hoping to do. That's great. That's great. Well, mm -hmm. any, maybe a last quick um, thought from each of you, if, if you want. Um, and I'm going to close with a little bit of inspiring uh, video from a shot when, when Greta Thunberg did her first um, Fridays for Future uh, visit here after she sailed across the Atlantic at the UN because it gets at some of the, the, the uh, activism part of what you're talking about. But any any last uh, points you want to make to uh, those who are watching who could be parents or students or uh, educators? Maybe uh, Governor? Just super exciting. You know, you, you're going to show a clip of Greta. You know, uh, the interesting thing to me is that over the last couple of years, the energy for activism has been coming from middle and high school students. And as someone who's been doing some teaching down at Harvard uh, and other places, you know, I'm almost fascinated that really when you look at who's taking action, who's committed, who isn't debating whether this is, whether it's real or not, but just like all in, how do we get the tools we need to make the change? It's coming from middle and high school students. So I'm super excited that Columbia is using their amazing resources to dedicate towards the group of people that I see as most committed to the activism, the learning, and the power to take it on that this age group is right now. There's no better example than Greta. So super exciting. And uh, for the scientists here, uh, maybe Lisa, a last quick uh, send away for anyone. Um, sure. I, I just want to um, basically echo what the what governor had said, because this this idea of having conversations that maybe some people are uncomfortable with that definitely are ways to approach them in different directions. We have the same issue at my institute working in developing countries, because thinking about the end of the 21st century is a really long way away and they've got very immediate pressures. Um, and so there, there are things that can be done, uh, planning, preparedness, um, as you build the path to resil resilience and adaptation and making the planet better, that um, involves the whole, the whole community of specialists, um, from artists to climate scientists. And, um, and I think is, is, a, is a time scale that um, is, is hard for anybody to argue with because we are all 
dealing with disasters in, in our lives in one way or another. It's so interesting. And the other issue that you've all already mentioned to a certain extent is um, that we live in a um, multiple challenge landscape. There's race, there's getting out of the pandemic, there's the next pandemic, and there's climate uh, resilience and change too. Uh, so I guess that's part of the learning is how to stay urgent on your issue, but still have that understanding of the wider landscape in people's heads, as Lisa just said, in developing countries, particularly where the just getting through the course of the day is a key, let alone uh, thinking about the end of the century. So there's much work to be done here. And again, maybe the last uh, Tom Chandler from the point of view of uh, disaster preparedness. The last thought. Um, yeah, there's. I was just thinking about the different conceptions of uh, citizenship that there are youth who want to focus on uh, basic procedural tasks. There are also youth that want to focus on the, uh, the science and policy aspects and, and those who are interested in the, uh, the social justice elements. And I think all of that can be uh, molded within a curriculum that uh, addresses all those issues and also in relation to disaster preparedness, response, recovery, and long-term resiliency from climate change. And this program is definitely going to do that. Great. So let's. Um, I'm going to show this video just because it. I was. Uh, uh, I went down to the UN well, for that my mom was recently moment. Shot this. You can see Greta uh, sitting uh, down there next to him. Like, uh, I'm so happy that Greta is here. Everyone has to know because I, I can't really believe that there are people that deny climate change. There are so many proofs of climate change. Uh, I think that the problem, uh, the, the bigger problem, uh, the biggest problem is that uh, governments try to make an immediate uh, uh, economical stability instead of a sustainable one. So, why are they focusing on using fossil fuels and that someday? Uh, not even their plan of making an immediate uh, economy will, it will fail because it will end. So it doesn't even make sense for economical power to, to invest in fossil fuels. We should all try to, it's not only the individual, but everyone has to make a change. And that starts uh, with voting. So, So what was exciting to me about that was Greta was on the sideshow. She reminded me there of my old friend Pete Seeger, the folk musician who um, I got to play with for 20 years. He was a completely different generation. But what Pete was very good at was stepping out of the circle. So he would play a great song, you know, uh, We Shall Overcome. But as he was playing it, he'd put his hand to his ear. And that meant it was your turn to sing. And for Greta to be sitting down, she, I don't think at that session, I didn't see her really leading any any of the uh, speech speaking, uh, speechifying. Uh, there's a whole army of young people who are out there poised to um, not just vote next, but to act next in many different ways. And it's great that you're all involved in uh, this effort to, to a certain extent, to get out of the way, to enable as much as possible, but to, uh, and to harness that energy to teach when there's stuff to be taught and to learn when there's stuff to be learned. Um, I think we're all still lifelong learners here, including what we learn from the people we face who are younger than we are. So it's great to have been part of this session today to help to uh, spread the word. Um, also, I'll just point out that on uh, Wednesday and Friday, we're switching gears toward, um, again, disaster response and recovery. Um, with a session on and on Wednesday is the first one we're hosting in fully in Spanish. In Espanol, um, my colleagues in, in Tom Chandler's shop will be running this uh, great session on uh, Puerto Rico lessons for and, and options for getting children at the front of the uh, picture in dealing with resilience going forward. And uh, I can't wait for that. And sorry, there was another on Friday, 
And Friday, the session will be in English, the same thing and focused on North Carolina. So thank you, uh, Governor Shumlin. Thank you to all my colleagues here at Columbia, various parts of the Earth Institute and beyond for being part of this session today on uh, climate youth, empowering climate youth for action going forward, including in Vermont. And stay well wherever you are, stay safe uh, um, at a distance where necessary and up close when you can. I'm Andy Revkin here at the uh, Earth Institute Annex in the Hudson Valley. And uh, share this video as soon as we're done with others. Uh, the link gets archived on Facebook, YouTube, uh, LinkedIn, and Twitter, uh, Periscope. And um, so we can continue the conversation. Remember what Cassie said about the uh, workshop coming up. And uh, thank you again for, uh, for all your time. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Andy. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Great being here. Take care. Andy, bye-bye.